Hello, good morning. Today we will be discussing about deep neck space infections. The questions that we uh, expect from this uh, class are define ludic angina, write down the clinical features and the treatment of ludic angina. Second is how will you differentiate between a submenibular salivary gland and the submenibular lymph node clinically. So this question might come in practicals as well as in theory sometimes. Basically you know should know in the practicals. What is the etiology of parapharyngeal abscess? Write down the clinical features, investigations, and treatment of parapharyngeal abscess. Uh, write down the clinical features, investigations, and treatment of acute or chronic retropharyngeal abscess. So, uh, we will basically be discussing about lytic angina, retropharyngeal abscess, and parapharyngeal abscess in details in this class. You might get any questions, you might get short questions, you might get a uh, few MCQs, or you might get long questions also from this topic. So, this is a, an important topic for you. First, what is ludic angina? Definition of ludic angina: It is defined as rapidly progressing polymicrobial cellulitis of the submandibular space that can result in life-threatening airway compromise. Very important. This is the most common cause of death in this condition is respiratory compromise, encircling of the upper airway. airway as you know, the ludic angina basically means strangling, like strangulation. This is the picture showing ludic angina. This is the submandibular space. Okay, this is the sublingual. This is the submaxillary space separated by the myeloid muscle. So as the infection spreads from this, this basically leads the tongue to fall posteriorly, basically backwards. This leading to respiratory distress. Most common cause of death is respiratory distress. The predisposing factors for this condition are first is dental or periodontal infection accounts for around 80% of all the cases of ludic angina. Uh, poor dental hygiene, uh, caries and abscess tooth and tooth extraction, lower molars and premolars that lead to uh, dental causes of ludic angina. Other conditions like upper respiratory, respiratory tract infections, floor of mouth trauma, small fish bone and those things, mandibular fractures, cellulitis also peritonsary abscess and IV drug abuse all might lead to infection of the submandibular space. But what we should know is cellulitis per se is not the cause for ludic angina. This is uh, a separate entity, so cellulitis. So most of the authors don't use cellulitis as the cause of ludic angina. Other comorbid conditions, diabetes mellitus, malnutrition, alcoholism, neutropenia, lupus erythematosus, aplastic anemia, Glomerular nephritis, all these conditions might predispose the patient for uh, ludic angina due to immunocompromised status. The causative organism, most common causative organism is group A beta amyloidic streptococcal species. Streptococcus pyogenes is the most common because it's the commensal in the oral flora, oral cavity, therefore, it might infect the submandibular space. Alpha amyloidic streptococcal species like Streptococcus viridans and Streptococcus pneumoniae. Staphylococcus aureus, Fusobacterium, Bacteroides, Melaninogenicus, and Oralis. They are anaerobic bacteria. So, all these bacteria are found in the oral cavity, both gram positive and gram negative, as well as uh, anaerobic organisms. Peptoristophobus, Ectronomyces, Nigeria species, like occasionally Pseudomonas species, E. coli, and Hemophilus influenza also might cause ludic angina. Uh, the second part of the question is what are the clinical features of ludic angina? So, the clinical features, its highest prevalence is seen among young adults. The most common symptom is pain in any involved teeth with severe tender localized swelling in the submenibular region. The patient basically comes to us with history of pain in the tooth followed by swelling in the neck, in the basically in the lateral neck or sometimes in the midline neck also in the submen submental as well as in the submenibular region. So, drooling of saliva due to uh, dysphagia, halitosis, trismus, started from laryngeal edema and elevation of the posterior tongue against the palate, uh, they are also common. Patients will have fever, chills, tachycardia as a part of uh, systemic infection or patient might be uh, toxic on toxic look. So there might be sepsis, all these are due to sepsis con septic conditions. On examination, there will be board like firmness of the floor of the mouth and brownie induration of superhyoid soft tissues. Sometimes we tell it as the second tongue appearance because you know that floor of mouth will be raised upwards leading to second tongue appearance also. There will be airway obstruction within hours as we know when the pus forms or when there is cellulitis then the tongue is 
push uh, push steadily leading to obstruction at the level of the orifharynx. You can see uh, different pictures here. So this is the swelling in the submen submental triangle as well as submandible region, and this is spreading to the chest. So this is necrotizing fasciitis so condition. So infection does not only uh, lie in the lyrics in the submandible space, but that has gone beyond the submandible space. In this case, this is true submandible space infection. You know there is submental plus submandible swelling, and this is a big swelling over here. There is a swelling in the submental region. In this side, you can see edema of all of the uh, submental region, and this this is a localized condition. So it might uh, present as different look conditions. Investigations are routine blood investigations are mandatory because you know there might be septicemia, there will be post culture has to be done. Plain radiographs to assess the degree of subtissue swelling and area obstruction are important. Uh, CT is more useful imaging tool than plain radiographs. CT scan is important by the in the CT scan you can know the site of lesion when there is uh, localized lesion or when there is uh, like when there is diffuse lesion. There might be caries. There might be spreading infection can be seen. Spread of the infection might be in not only in one area. It might be in other spaces also. Uh, treatment of the condition is frequent assessment is important to assess the risk of progression and airway compromise. As we told, airway compromise is the most important condition that might lead the patient to death. Empirical therapy with high dose intravenous antibiotics like cefuroxime and metronidazole can be given. Uh, as you know, we have to send the patients post for culture if there is pus, but most of the times this is uh, just transurate, not pus. This is cellulitis. Instant drainage, uh, intraoral or external, both can be performed. Suppose if you can see the intraoral first point, you can remove, you can just drain from there. And most of the times, when the patient is having dental infection, when the no, when the tooth is extracted, then pus can come out from the tooth root. So patient might not need the external incision. But externally, when the infection, when the uh, swelling is very weak, or when the swelling just is causing the area of obstruction then you have you, trans, you have to give transverse incision across the midline from one angle of the throat to the other muscles of the neck muscles of the tongue are opened vertically and mild height muscle section longitudinally so drains are uh, placed in all facial spaces as you know the facial spaces they are uh, they restrict the inflammation so they just control that they take the inflammation in, in them in themselves so you have to place the drain in different facial spaces Tracheostomy is sometimes uh, necessary to maintain an airway. So when the patient gets early airway, the, there is high chance of patient survival. So this is the lesion then localized. So just we make incision over here as this is a localized condition. Also localized condition, just we make the incision and process drain. But as the patient is having diffuse inflammation, so drains have been kept in multiple areas in the neck. So this is the incision. We make a big incision from one angle of mandible to the opposite side. Coming to the second topic for today, which is retrophagnal abscess. Uh, it is defined as collection of pus in the retrophagnal space. It is classified into acute and chronic retrophagnal abscess. So, in the exam, you might be asked either acute retrophagnal abscess or chronic or in split. So, acute retrophagnal abscess is common in children below 5 years of age. Why? What is the reason behind that? I think we will come later on. The predisposing factors are superation of retrophagnal lymph node of rubia. This is the most important thing the, as the children get infection in childhood. Acute retrophagnal abscess is common in childhood. Because in adults, uh, rubia's lymph node is not usually present. This is the like. So in children, this is commonly present. Therefore, children are prone to get acute retrophagnal abscess in childhood. So next is penetrating foreign body like fish bones, small and small children. Sometimes if you, fish, if you just uh, feed them fish, then fish bone might be uh, might be stuck in, in the oropharynx. Post surgical status, especially either particular body surgery, neurosurgery, those conditions might lead to abscess formation. Clinical features are symptoms. There will be history of upper respiratory infection, as you know. The reverse lymph is the most common one to be affected as superative lymphadenitis. Then, second is dysphagia, the child cannot swallow properly. There will be difficulty in breathing or noisy breathing because of respiratory obstruction. There will be pubic cough and torticollis. As there is pain, the child cannot move that part of the hair or neck. 
Science at the side will be ill looking, febrile, drooling of saliva will be there because the patient cannot swallow properly. There will be hyperextension of the head and the voice will be like hot potato voice, muffled voice. There will be neck swelling and tenderness might be seen from, might be examined from outside. There will be bulge in the posterior phenyl wall, usually in that one, uh, true retrophenyl abscess. As you know, the true retrophenyl space is divided by into two planes, okay, two areas, medial and lateral, by the by the midline raphe okay so uh, you can just have tracheal rock sign that is defined as pain while they gently moving the larynx and trachea from to side to side okay? there will be just pain but you know when the patient is having repenal abscess sometimes you might not be able to uh, elicit the laryngeal crepitus laryngeal crepitus so uh, if there is no laryngeal crepitus but there is severe pain while gently moving the larynx and trachea from to side to side and there is a bulge in the posterior phenyl wall, usually in lateral, then you have to think of acute retrophenyl abscess. abscess. What is the reason behind hyperextension of the head? This you should understand. Sometimes you might be asked in the exam. This is because when the patient hyperextends the neck, then they can at least contain some extra amount of the pus. So if they, if they flex, there will be respiratory distress. If they have hyperextension, they can at least contain some amount of uh, pus in the rear area. So that is the reason behind hyperextension of the head. Investigations to be carried out at complete blood count. Uh, there might be safety here. The total count might increase with neutrophils also might increase. There will, you can see plain x-rays of tissue lateral which is the one of the most conventionally performed uh, x-ray. It is a still performed nowadays also and you might be asked in the final exam in, in practicals especially in BIBA. So at the level of C2, suppose if you do X-rays of the snake lateral view, okay, then uh, at the level of C2, the distance from the anterior border of the cervical vertebrae to the posterior border of the airway should be around less than 70 mm regardless of the patient's age. So it, in any age, it should be less than 70 mm in, at the level of C2. At C6, should be less than 40, 14 mm in children younger than 15 years and up to 22 mm in adults. Just for you to remember, C2, C6, 7, 14, 21. Okay, just so you can remember like that. Level of C2 should not be more than 7 mm, regardless of patient's age. At C6, should be less than 14 mm in children and should be up to 20 mm in adults. So, 7, 14, 21, like that. Okay, you can write 21 also. So, if there is widened pre vertebral soft tissue is shallow, more than normal in all ages, or more than two thirds of the corresponding cervical vertebral body, that signifies retrophenyl abscess. This is important. Suppose more than two thirds of corresponding cervical vertebral body, because in the X-ray it will be difficult to measure. Sometimes they will give 95 percent, 95 percent like that in uh, computerized X-rays. Therefore, like uh, if you have the X-ray with you, then if you can just measure. Uh, when the pre bird why didn't pre bird is more than to the corresponding cervical vertebral body, then you can say that person is having retrophenyl space abscess, at least widened retrophenyl space. Uh, CT scan of neck shows extent of abscess, involvement of the other spaces, okay, as already told in recent China. So, involvement of other abscess spaces might be there because. It might be near the paraphernalia space. Sometimes the infection can spread to even uh, the other spaces like some, some manual space. So CT scan is a better choice if we can do. Both plane and contrast CT scans can be performed. Complications are basically they occur second, due to secondary mass effect. So when there is swelling, when there is abscess formation, then there will be respiratory distress. Rupture of the abscess sometimes even during intubation might lead to expiration and the infection might spread from one area to other. So there might be uh, septicemia or infection can even spread to the uh, to the mediastinum. So the patient might, might uh, present you with mediastinitis when the infection is down. So you know the lower border of the dependent, true dependent spaces up to the bifurcation of the trachea. So this is the mediastinum. You can see the uh, abscess here. So the, in this case, this is X-ray of the child. Is the plain X-ray, soft tissue lateral view. So this is there is widened prevertebral space. Okay, this space has been widened prevertebral soft tissue shadow. So this is the so prevertebral soft tissue shadow. This is the airway. So this is the cervical vertebral body. So this is obvious. This is more than two thirds at every 
area so every corresponding area so this is Little feather space abscess. So uh, we can only tell abscess because the most common prototype being the abscess might be sometimes might be what when the person is have when the person is having trauma. So in this case you can see straightened cervical vertebral bodies also due to pain and spasm. So there is straightening. Otherwise, otherwise normally there is you no know, straightening. In this case also there is straightening of the cervical vertebral bodies. You know this is extra of the child itself, and there is widening of the pre vertebral surface shadow. Uh, in this case this is the airway which has been narrowed so there is obvious airway compromise you can see and this is the air fluid level this is the fluid and this is the air, air fluid level can be seen on the on the x-ray okay in the subtitling lateral view and there will be spine has been uh spinal cervical vertebral bodies and the spine is erect okay so this is the ct scan as you know the ct scan is a better choice than x-rays you can see there is the abscess over here this is a pre vertebral space abscess probably okay, because this is vertebra, this is pre vertebral area and this is the bulging in the posterior phalangeal wall and this is usually in case of patients having acute retrophalangeal abscess true so this is unilateral condition so mostly as we have to already told this will be uh, unilateral condition this is unilateral so this is true retrophalangeal space abscess okay and this is the bulge as uh, endoscopic finding uh, this is the epiclodis and this is the endoscopic finding as you can see the endoscopic finding of the retrophenyl abscess there is a bulge in the retrophenyl area so how to treat patient needs adequate hydration in IV fluids are to be given systemic antibiotics like ceftriaxone, metronidazole can be given uh, so they are given empirically instant drainage has to be performed it can be, it can be done by transoral approach or by Transcervical operas. So, transural, uh, we don't require anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Patient will be supine with head low to avoid aspiration. And instant and suction of pulse has to be done. There will be strong, good suction has to be there. Otherwise, sometimes patient might either swallow or there will be uh, aspiration of the pulse. Transcervical is performed through the lateral neck incision and there is balls in the lateral neck. So, it is easy to make an incision from there and we can uh, remove the pus but thing is there might be sometimes there might be pharyngocutaneous fistula so after when the infection is there when the pus is there so just uh, try to make as small incision as possible and trigastomy can be trigastomy has to be done when the patient is having respiratory distress this is the drainage of retroviral abscess per oral intra, intra orally so this is the this is the table the patient has to be kept in the edge of the table get the head low and this, this is the abscess so then just depress the tongue okay just uh, and this has to be incised so as you know this table edge of the table has to be almost at the level of the patient's uh, abscess so there will be no expiration it will not go down okay this basically it will not go towards the trachea or towards the esophagus so that will come down but you have to have a strong suction that sucks out this the pus coming to chronic retrophenyl space abscess causes are carriage of cervical spine is the most common one so cervical tuberculosis then tubercular infection of the retrophenyl lymph node of rubiers basically in children as happens in tubercular infection is a chronic one and post traumatic conditions of the neck when there is post trauma leading to fracture of the of the cervical spine or vertebral bodies then or sometimes penetrating foreign bodies when they go in the retrophenyl area that might lead to the abscess formation clinical features are a chronic discomfort in the throat and then dysphagia and bulge of posterior phalangeal wall with fluxion swelling this is significantly different from acute acute patient will have difficulty in swallowing there will be uh, complete difficulty in swallowing okay so there will be uh, fever there might be fever so the bulge of posterior phalangeal wall will also will be there so there might not be fluctuation in, in the acute stages might be cellularis only but in chronic phase there will be chronic discomfort patient basically will come with uh, chronic discomfort in throat and you know the patient will be uh, they cannot eat properly so they will come to you with basically non-specific discomforts forms are either lateral type or might be central type lateral type you know concentration of the cervical lymph node spreading to the nodes and forming a cold abscess this is important this is lateral type cervical lymph node of rubiers this is in lateral condition separated by the midline raphe so this will be and bulge will be in lateral. It is usually seen in children below five years of age because rubiers lymph node is active in this age. 
swelling is usually seen intraorally is classically on the sides and not in the midline so this is the due to central raphia so this again facial spaces they try to contain the infection within themselves swelling is fluctuant and with minimal signs of inflammation because this is a chronic stage and although it's fluctuant there will be minimal signs of inflammation will be there the central type is due to pots tuberculosis tuberculosis of the spine so this is true pre vertebral space abscess not true root pharyngeal although there are three uh, three spaces just posted to the pharynx as you know then this is true root pharyngeal space next is dentary space and the pre vertebral space so this central type usually occurs in the, in the pre vertebral space abscesses abscess is present between the body of the vertebra and the pre vertebral fascia so this is the pre vertebral space abscess it begins in the midline and it spreads to both sides on oral examination there is a swelling in the midline in the posterior phenyl wall which is fluctuant with less signs of inflammation obviously in chronic phase but when you see diffuse bulge in the posterior phenyl wall that is that is probably due to pre vertebral space abscess when you see unilateral bulge that is due to pre, true root to root phenyl space abscess just remember that Investigations are as an acute reference to space, you have to go for X-ray, CT scan, and during the stem, suppose after aspiration, because you know the in uh, chronic form, tuberculosis is one of the common conditions. So you have to do during stem also. Then treatment by IV antibiotics, instant and drainage of pus, either a oral or external approach, anti-tubercular chemotherapy for tuberculosis, and next any exploration sometimes when the when there is foreign body penetrating trauma, it has to be done. But you have to be careful while doing the portal incision because there is no, suppose when the patient is having pors cervical spine, so there might patient should not uh, we should not do extra extension hyper extension should be avoided. Okay, that has to be done before and X ray is already done, so you know how much uh, decay is there in the in the cervical bodies. So complications of chronic reference space abscess are area obstruction again when there is. The infl inflammation that might be airway obstruction, spread of abscess to other neck spaces, septic man death in case of true retrofinal space abscesses. So in chronic form, the complications are less in comparison to acute form, but sometimes we don't know when the patient, when the patient is having uh, fever, or when the patient is having other immunocompromised status, or when the patient is having any infections, then acute and chronic inflammation might be there. Chronic infection might become acute. Coming to the last topic for today, parafinal space abscess. Etiology is in the pharynx, in the you know parapharyngeal. So this is in relation to the pharynx. This is just lateral to the pharynx. Okay. So the causes of pharynx might be acute tonsillitis. You know the tons peritons peritonsal abscess, peritonsal spaces uh, related to the parapharyngeal space space. So infection can spread from tonsillitis or peritonsal space abscess to parapharyngeal space abscess. Peritonsal abscesses. Then teeth, dental infections like lower 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 last molar, so that can that can spread to parietal space. Then ear visual abscess, visual abscess is the abscess which goes through. What is that? Through the sternocleidomastoid muscle, so it might come in the neck. Okay, visual abscess, visual sternocleidomastoid. Then serial disease through the digastric. So remember that. Others like parotid abscess, you know, parotid lies in the lateral aspect of the parapharyngeal space, little space which lies more medially and posteriorly, and some inner space lies more anteriorly because the lower border of the parapharyngeal space is the higher bone. So penetrating injuries directly in the parapharyngeal area, they also might uh, lead to parapharyngeal space abscess formation. The clinical features are, you know. Although all the species are uh, dangerous, space infections are dangerous, but parapharyngeal space infection is more dangerous in relation to other, other species. There will be fever, sore throat, rhinophagia, and torticollis might be present. Intercompartment syndromes like uh, tonsil are in the in the intercompartment, the infections, it, the tonsils might be pushed immediately because this is more anteriorly. In relation along the angle of the mandible, and there will be trismus by medial pterygoid inflammation. Then external swelling behind the angle of the jaw, it can be visible on parapharyngeal space infection of the anterior aspect, anterior compartment. You know there are uh, no neurovascular com compartment, no neurovascular uh, conditions or structures in the anterior compartment. In the posterior compartment, it is basically a vascular compartment, so-called neurovascular compartment. 
the bulge of the pharynx behind the posterior pillar, the paralysis of the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th canine lobes, and subacral symmetric chain sometimes might lead to, might lead to Hardman's syndrome. It can erode into the carotid artery or cause septic thrombophilitis of the internal jugular vein. So, Lemire syndrome. Uh, so, there is a term called as Lincoln's Highway because you know the internal artery, the common carotid artery that that goes against okay, near vascular bundle all the go from the ne neck towards the head suppose so that tract will be persisting there so infection can spread from the tract from the carotid sit down okay so that is called as the Lincoln's highway so infection can spread from the neck towards the mediastinum okay or from the neck towards the brain also it might go through the chain so this is the uh, CT scan so in abscess in the paraffin area this is the paraffin space abscess which is pushing the uh, the lateral phenyl wall more medially okay this is the medial displacement that you can see this is the these are the arteries which are just pushed medially carotids artery and veins again you can see the infection over here so this is the mandible the infection is just medial to the mandible okay and the, this is also the infection the, the lateral phenyl wall has been pushed more medially okay, towards the opposite side again you can see post you can see the abscess which is there is a which is lined by the some area of hello some hello can be seen in the lateral aspect so investigations wise uh, cbc as the CT scan are important clinical investigations to be performed. CT scan is one of the best investigations to be performed in all next spaces. Okay, with plain and contrast CT scan has to be done. The treatment is by systemic antibiotics, broad spectrum systemic antibiotics, ceftriaxone, amoxiclap, metronidazole, both gram positive and gram negative coverage as well as negative coverage to be given. So instant drainage uh, by intraoral drainage from the transfer fossa or external drainage from the neck can be done both internal as well as intraoral as well as external drainage you know the tonsillary fossa you know tonsils, tonsils are the medial boundaries of the paraffinary space abscess paraffinary space so we can do intraoral through tonsillary fossa or external through the neck when there is abscess when there is swelling in the neck can be seen there are different surgical approaches i think these are not important for you from examination point of view but just to name them to paraffinary space from outside they are transoral through the mouth that is from inside and the cervical with or without mandibulotomy through the neck cervical incision is made in the neck then sometimes the mandible uh, can be split or not so we have to reach in the paraffin space then cervical parotid you know the both cervical incision can be extended to the parotid incision enter to the enter to the ear just to make a bigger incision you can to train the abscess the parotid gland is a lateral lateral uh, relationship with the sub in the paraffin space transparotid again deep lower parotid is in, is in relation to the lateral aspect of the paraffin space and infratemporal fossa when the infection has gone more up then you can even go through the infratemporal fossa so common uh, approaches are the in, in intraoral that is transoral and external will be cervical approach without mandibulotomy without, without mandibulotomy cervical parotid transparotid or infratemporal fossa so this finishes today's class. Then if you have any questions, you can uh, ask me the questions.